What's up, Fathom fam? Christina Scott here with Pastor Kyle Nelson. We're getting ready to launch into 30 days of prayer. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I love these these seasons as a church. We kind of get out of our uh, individual rhythms and really join together in this corporate rhythm that uh, is always really special and really formative, I think, in all of our lives. Yeah. yeah. So a few questions for you for people who maybe haven't ever done this before. Yeah. Don't know, like, what is this? Why 30 days of prayer? What's this about? What's Fathom doing? Yeah. What are we doing? So what is this rhythm for us? Yeah, so as a church, we, we really have these two times in the year that we kind of break away from our group seasons and we come together in a season of 21 days of prayer and fasting at the beginning of a year. It's just a good start to our yeah. year um, and really consecrating ourselves. And then in August, kind of post-summer, it's like a good kind of reset for the fall for our church and each of us individually within the church too. So that's what it is. We lean in together. We read scripture together. Um, our sermon series will be kind of going with that. Um, we'll be in like you know groups on apps and stuff and just kind of threads to just be learning um, And we're gonna provide some teaching a, a little bit later in this video as well um, On prayer and so we're just growing this so such a pivotal area of our life and prayer It's just when we lean in and, and really kind of draw close. Yeah, what? Speaking about that we're gonna have a sermon series. It's kind of coordinating with our scripture mm -hmm. reading guide what drew you to Faithful in Babylon, right? So that's there. There's the title reveal. What drew you to Faithful in Babylon? These stories of Joseph and the story of Daniel. What drew you to that? Why are we doing that this month? Honestly, in my own reading to study, I was really moved by their faithfulness. Um, it's just incredible. I, I think I read somewhere and, and heard that, you know, Daniel served in the the court of a Persian king for 30 years. Um, and I was just moved by that. Like I, I think in our world that's overwhelmingly like sinful and those of us, who, those of you that are working in like corporate environments or like ungodly environments or your kids are in the school system, like mine are like, it's just, they're just kind of surrounded, you know, whether it's flipping the TV on or going to the grocery store or going to Disney or whatever it is, it feels like we're surrounded by unfaithfulness. And so I was really moved by these stories of Daniel and Joseph, men who did not live easy lives, no. who had very difficult lives and who were faithful. Like in, uh, like Daniel was faithful in Babylon. Mm -hmm. Joseph was faithful even being sold into slavery in Egypt. Right. And how God still blessed them and still used them. And it was there's so many lessons to be learned here. And so I just felt like, you know, we're not living in Babylon. We're not living in Egypt. But we're living in America. We're living in Jacksonville. And I feel like we can learn and we can glean a lot from their faithfulness yeah. um, over a long period of time. And uh, that, that's just my heart <laughs> for my own life is just faithfulness over a really long time, no matter what's going on around me. And I think everybody's going to really connect with that story, both in the text and in our own life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one last question, and this is not just for people who haven't been around, but even those of us who have gone through these 30 days of prayer, we've been part of this mm -hmm. rhythm, been at Fathom for a long time, but like really, truly, what are the expectations, right? We do this 30 days of prayer and we talk to people and we tell them like, oh, there's a scripture reading guide and oh, there's a group yeah. to join, you know, those kinds of things. But, but really, what are the expectations? Um, I... I, I like to untangle that a lot within us because I think we do go into certain expectations of ourselves yeah. um, that are often more cloaked in legalism where it's like, I'm going to check all the boxes off and that feels really good. And I feel like I'm a good Christian because I checked off all the boxes or the expectations of God, like, you know, or, or in our own life, say like, let's leave God decide for a second. Like even in our own life of like, Oh, I'm going to have this breakthrough and, and yeah, like we're going to pray for those things. But I think oftentimes some of that can cloud just the purity of getting to know Jesus, yeah. like getting to know God and, and meeting him in the quietness of our days, in the collection and the community of joining together at a night of prayer and worship. And just like, you know, I, there's this phrase I, I, I've been saying for a while now, it's like, I think that I began to just really embrace in my own life in a deep way is like, okay, God, do your thing. <laughs> okay, God, do your thing. Yeah. And that's 
so I say all that to say, like, my expectations. I believe that God's going to do amazing things. I believe that he's going to write my world. But explicitly what that is and specifically what that is, I have no idea. Um, because I believe he's going to pull back some things in my heart that actually I didn't see coming. Right. He's going to reveal some things that I don't even understand. He's going to inspire some things that I haven't even thought about yet. You know, so my expectations are huge for this season, but not in like a way that I can control, but just a way that I can submit myself to and really just watch God be God. You know, so maybe that helps somebody like just unwind a little bit of the expectations, but also just like ramp them up at the same time, right. you know, in like a really refreshing way freeing way that I think is the a lot of the beauty of this great wild adventure we're on with God is just to experience him and to experience his plan unfolding and his goodness to reveal his good plans in and through us um, so yeah I'm pumped <laughs> yeah I think it's as you were even saying that I sat, sat there thinking yeah like Joseph and Daniel like what were their expectations? And then we get into their story and get to see like God blew their expectations out of the water. Um, cause mm-hmm. he's just that good. He's yeah. Just that good, so. Yeah. My brain immediately wants to start preaching or pre preaching, a little, but, <laughs> but we'll save those for faithful. And that yeah. yeah. So grab your scripture reading guide. We're excited. You can get that on church center app. It's in your email. Grab your scripture reading guide and follow along with us. You can, like Pastor Cal said, you can have it on your phone. You know, you don't have to have, if you're not a paper person, but I'm a paper person. So yeah, absolutely. Like person. Well, cool. We are going to uh, dive into the Word for a few minutes. And uh, if you'll just join me, yeah. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to dive into the Word and, and do some um, teaching and um, just r- wrestling with the scriptures as uh, we're seeking God in this season to go a little deeper and and uh, I, I was really thinking through uh, about um, in the Old Testament, there's something known as the Ark of the Covenant. If you have no idea, you, maybe you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? <laughs> uh, Ark. Um, but the, the Ark of the Covenant, in the Old Testament, um, God's, God kind of uniquely withheld his presence to certain locations and specific people, and he'd pour out his heart mm-hmm. or his, his presence in specific moments, like in a burning bush, he'd reveal his presence in a cloud and in fire. like, um, And then he withheld it within the Ark of, of the Covenant in this unique way. And so as Christians, New Testament believers, we can kind of, I mean, where's the Holy Spirit living as believers? Like within us, and his presence is within us. And it's kind of hard to kind of get ourselves back in that frame of mind. Um, but, you know, I, I won't kind of trace all the history with the Ark of the Covenant, but I want to go to this passage in 2 Samuel chapter 6, where David is king now, and God's presence withheld there, like representative there in, in the Ark of the Covenant, and they're transporting. God had given them very specific instructions about who is to hold the covenant or the Ark of the Covenant, who is supposed to move it. And there's this scene that, that kind of unfolds, 2 Samuel chapter 6, um, and I, I guess I'll pick up on verse um, 5. I guess I'll pick up on verse 5. Verse 6 is really when it goes down. Here's what happened. Well, I'll, actually, I'll go to verse 4. So they brought it with the ark of God from the house of Abinadab. It was being held there, um, which was on the hill and Ohio. Um, not to be confused with Ohio, was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made with fir wood and with lyres, with harps, tambourines, castanets, and cymbals. They're bringing the ark. They're moving the ark. They're bringing it to uh, Jerusalem is the game plan there. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nikon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen nearly upset it. So just picture this scene. Hey, they're kind of moving in a company like they're celebrating. They are pumped. I'm thinking of like a championship parade. Yeah. Right. And they've got mm-hmm. they've got the the trophy that they're carrying through and everybody's moving through there. But this isn't a trophy. This has got the presence of God that they're withholding. And so there's a place for praise and for celebration. There's a reverence around God's presence as well. But something happens and the oxen, like, it nearly gets upset. And this guy, Uzzah, reaches out to touch the Ark of Covenant. Long story short, 
God's anger, verse 7, and God's anger burns against Uzzah, and God struck him down for his irreverence that he had touched the Ark of the Covenant um, in an irreverent way. What, what, what do you think about when you hear that story about, I mean, I know what I think of. Like, what do you think of there? Right. So my thing in instantly go to, like, if I saw my child, right, this thing that is so precious to me, yeah. right, the, this is the presence of God that's so yeah. precious to them. If I saw my child about to fall from a cart, I would reach out to, to, to care for my yeah. kid, too, right? I kind of feel bad for who's up. Right. I'm like, dude was just trying to, like, do the right thing. It felt like, at least in that moment. And so I think we have to understand, like, what what's... What's taking place here? And I think there's this really deep message about the presence of God for in times of prayer and fasting and seasons where we want to grow and we, we want more of God's presence. And some of us may be asking ourselves, like, I haven't felt God's presence in a very long time. Or maybe you've never felt God's presence. That's confusing. You don't even know what that means. And sometimes you feel like, well, if I just do this, right? If I just check all these boxes and I do these things, right, then God's presence. And I think in some ways, we can find ourselves like Uzzah, feeling like I've got to like prop up God's presence, or I've got to make something happen. But I think there's this <coughs> message here for us that it's not us who's holding up the presence of God. The presence of God is holding mm-hmm. us up. And th- it's irreverent for us to even think, hey, no, I'm going to hold God up, and, and that His His presence is, is to be cherished. Mm-hmm. And it is holy, and it is um, powerful. God shows his power here. Well, there's an interesting th- thing that takes place here, because God's angry at Uzzah. David gets mad at God. And he's like, God, what the heck? Right. This doesn't make any sense. And then he's like, well, I tell you what, I don't want that ark. Like, you take if that's the presence of God, get it away from here. Um, and I know in my own life, like, I have seen abuses of the presence of God. I've seen abuses of people trying to manipulate what God's doing. I've seen kind of stuff that's kind of called wildfire, but that's just like, it's just, it's just nuts. It's not, God's not in it. And I think I pushed away from it at times. Kind of almost, uh, some of us maybe right now, we're like, I want God to show up in my life. But then also, like, when he starts moving in our life and it's a little bit uncomfortable, um, we're like, no, no, I'm actually afraid of that. Right. And and that's what happened for David. He's like, I don't want that Ark of the Covenant. I'm afraid of it. And some of us, we're afraid of our next steps. We're afraid of drawing closer to God in fear of what might change in our lives. What parts of us that are going to need to die mm-hmm. to be able to, to have him just ha- like habitating in our life, dwelling in our life, yeah. abiding in our life. You know, so David's unwilling for like three months to bring the Ark to Jerusalem. Well, what happens? <laughs> yeah, well, Abinadab has is is blessed. Yeah. Like above and beyond. Yeah, the guy who has it, it's like things are going amazing. Like he, he David begins to see the blessing and they're like, hey, David, like, I think it's okay, man. Like this dude's like life's good for him. Yeah. And David's like, all right, if that's the case, then like come on, <laughs> let's get the ark. So they get the Ark of the Covenant to um, Jerusalem. And it had been just so long that they had neglected the ark. They had neglected the presence of God. And I know for some of us right now watching this, maybe if you're really honest, like you've neglected the presence of God. You've kind of rushed about your day. You've done all, like you're just staying busy. And I, I read this great book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry that really spoke to that, saying that hurry is one of the greatest detriments to our spiritual life. So some of you, you need to slow down and you need to dive into his word and you need to uh, establish a, a daily rhythm of prayer, not just once a day, but throughout your day so that we're not neglecting it. Well, I want to flip over to Second Chronicles chapter 5 and the ark is brought into, now, now we've moved, David had created, a, a, brought the ark into a tent and now his son Solomon is king. And Solomon has created, built a temple for God. And now they're bringing the ark into the temple. And here's what uh, it said. Um, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 11 says, When the priests came forth from the holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves. Right? They had washed themselves, cleansed themselves, so that they could enter into uh, the temple and into the presence of God. 
without regard to division. So they're not worried about their family. They're not worried about their tribe. They're coming together in unison, in unity. So holiness, unity, key factors, thing, things that are taking place. And the Levitical singers, he lists them there. And the sons and the kinsmen clothed in fine linen. And all these musical instruments, they come together. There's 120 of them. So New Testament believers, we think of what? We start thinking of the, the upper room, like the 120. They're coming together here. And 120 priests are blowing the trumpets in unison, all together, not harmony, in unison. Uh, and they just begin to do this. They begin to lift up one voice, verse 13 says, to praise and to glorify the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice, uh, accompanied uh, by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, when they praised the Lord, saying, He indeed is good for His loving kindness is everlasting. Then the house, the house of the Lord, the temple, uh, was filled with clouds so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. I mean, it's a powerful image. Can you imagine being in that room? I mean... I think that's part of why it's so powerful, right? Yeah. Is because you try to imagine it and go, okay, this uh, this is awesome, even as I'm imagining it. And that, I like actually being there. You cannot stand, right? So that last verse, they the priests could not stand to minister mm -hmm. because the cloud was so great. It was so filled with cloud. So we talk about the presence of God. Other times like we talk about the glory of God that shows up. And, it's, and it is a supernatural presence of God, but it's a... It's a weight. It's a weightiness that humbles us. And, um, and I just encourage you to open yourself up for, for God to reveal more weight of who He is. Um, we know in part, we experience in part on this side of eternity, but, but there's a day coming that we'll experience uh, that full weight of, of glory. And so I, I want you to be open to, to more of, of the presence of God. I want to flip over finally to... Um, the book of Ezra, right? We're fast forwarding in time. And, and this is at the beginning of Ezra's ministry um, right now. And, and we're going to read verse 9 and 10, Ezra chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. It says, For on the first of the first month he began to go up to Babylon, and on the first of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem, because the good hand of his God was upon him. And here's the verse, Ezra chapter 7, verse 10 says this, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord. He set his heart on studying the law of the Lord to, um, to practice it and to teach it. So he set his heart to study it, to practice it, and teach it. And in this season, right now, wherever you're at, I want to encourage you, set your heart on studying the Word of God. There is a reading we lean in, uh, and, and we, we read the, the Word of God on a daily basis, or at least every other day we're leaning in. So that we're going to study it. It's not so we can check off a box. It's so that we can practice it. So slow down. Maybe take less in. And go deeper with that. So that you can practice it. Apply it. Talk about it. And then hopefully that talking turns into teaching. I teach it to my kids. I can teach it to my friends. I can teach it to, to um, people in my small group. I can be pouring into. And I believe that God's going to do a deep work in us in this season. So wherever you're at, I just want to encourage you. Um, don't be afraid of the presence of God. Be reverent and humble towards it, knowing that we're not propping it up, um, but it's holy, the presence of God is holding us up, literally filling our life. It's our strength. It's not our own strength by which we're moving through and growing. It's, it's the sanctifying work of God. Uh, but we're also leaning in and praying for more weight of God's glory in our life. And, and furthermore, we're, we're doing like growing through His Word, and we're studying, we're setting our heart on studying the Word of God, and uh, so that we may practice it. Okay.